welcome to us. Um, great to welcome friends from Portsmouth, worshiping with us as well. And if you look into the newsletter, African Praise Only. It's, a, it's a, actually a, a section within the territory. I'm coming here on the 24th of February to praise. It's not a closed shop. Any of us can come. Come and really enjoy that worship um, with our friends there. It's really good to welcome you today and our friends too. I'm joyous to see you back with us. I um, hope you're okay. Iris, it's, it's just wonderful to see Iris. Um, I just walked in Iris and thought, that's just, I don't need to say anything. I'm just going to just got a smile. That was enough. But it's really lovely um, to see you. So we're going to go and worship together just now. Thank you. Hello and welcome to the second of our films for this year's Dustin Hallowfield. <coughs> Very, very different grammar. 
there's a lot of pastoral care talks that need to happen and that are limited by the need for a translator. So many conversations that would be better if I could properly understand and people could express themselves freely. Sunday is obviously the, the day of the Lord. We in the Sunday service. The older generation will speak English really well, but also Greenlandic. Uh, while the younger generations speak much more Greenlandic. We sing in Greenlandic, we read scripture in Greenlandic. When people give their testimony, we ask that they do it in their own language. But all the talking in between, at least the talk I'm doing, is in Danish. That is a connection point for most people, especially the older generations. The singing hymns is something that unites people and touches people. The culture here is not a culture where people talk about feelings much, and during singing, the emotions can come out. So it's both a connection with the Lord and a real expression of worship, as well as its therapy and its its community. Success is seeing people's lives transform. Small steps but also big steps and everything in between. Whether it's people reconnecting with the kids, seeing people make commitments for the Lord, seeing people move forward and ask for prayer, even that first step with so much hope to just be there on the sidelines, participate in, in people's joy, in uh, people's freedom. It's, it's amazing. Officership is and about sharing the gospel with people while living it out. We could talk about this spiritual work and social work, but it's, it's really the same thing. What Jesus is, is talking about is, is loving our neighbor, it's walking the extra mile, it's, it's forgiving, it's uh, this is what we do. Next week we'll be going to India. I'm looking forward to seeing you then. And so as we sing this week's self in our video, I'd just like to invite someone or maybe a couple of people to pray for the work that we've just heard about, maybe pray for Work with the Salvation Army that you're aware of and want to pray for us on your heart today and pray for us as we come into worship. So shall we spend some moments praying together? <coughs> Thank you. 
great oceans that pound the shores, they can proclaim your greatness, O God, and your love for your human creatures throughout this world. How glorious it is to be alive, O Lord. May every breath of my body, every beat of my heart, be dedicated to your praise and glory. Amen. If you've got your Bibles open in front of you, you'll see that those reimagining or the reimagining of those words don't engage with the whole psalm. If we were to engage with all 52 verses, then we'd be here for even longer than normal. But Psalm 89 is often quoted for recognising the words that we'll hear later in our time together from 2 Samuel chapter 7 as expressing a covenant between God and David. Verses 3 and 4 of Psalm 89 in the NIV say, You said I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David my servant. I will establish your line forever and make your throne firm through all generations. Verses 28 and 29 say, I will maintain my love for him, David, forever, and my covenant with him will never fail. I will establish his line forever, his throne as long as the Yemen's enjoy. And then there's lots more that we could pick through if we were to look at verses 30 to 39. But we'll think a bit more about David's covenant with God later in our time together. But having said, having all said and shared those words, I feel like singing this morning, O oh Lord, we're going to sing our opening song. The NIV translates verse 1 as, I will sing the Lord's great love forever. And we're going to turn to song number 965, if you're following in the song of the words that will appear on the screen. And words that say, let us sing of his love once again. There are words that we'll sing to that tune the band played before we started this morning, I believe we shall win. Maybe my choice was slightly influenced by band practice last week when we rehearsed the new rock arrangements of this tune. But this morning we're singing to the tune of the arrangements. We'll save the rock arrangement for another time. But I'll invite you to stand as we sing the first two verses. Thank you, Brian. <laughs> Thank you. 
home, and if you want to follow along, your Bible for starting at verse 5 and reading through to verse 16. And these are the words of God spoken to the prophet Nathan. Go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord says. Are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? I've not dwelt in a house from the day I brought the Israelites up out of Egypt to this day. I've been moving from place to place with a tent as my dwelling. Wherever I have moved with all the Israelites, did I ever say to any of their rulers whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, why do you not build me a house of sin? Now then, tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture, from tending the flock, and appointed you a ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have cut off all your enemies from before you. Now I will make your name great, like the names of the greatest men on earth. And I will provide a place for my people Israel, and will plant them so that they can have a home of their own, and no longer be disturbed. Wicked people will not oppress them anymore, as they did at the beginning, and have done ever since the time I appointed leaders over my people Israel. I will also give you rest from all your enemies. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish our house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod welded by men, with floggings inflicted by human hands, but my love will never be taken away from you, as I took it away from Saul, who I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. Looking at the army resource that was put together for Covenant Sunday, it describes what I've been calling the essential covenant ingredients as God's promise to bring a descendant from David's line whose kingdom and throne will last forever, pointing ultimately to Jesus. It describes the response of David and God's people, Israel, as keeping the laws given to Moses. And it suggests that the sign of the covenant is the temple. Although, as we've just heard, the temple wasn't something that David needed to worry about. We might also spend a moment thinking about the commitment and response recognised as being required of God's people. Because, yes, David and the Israelites are told what's best for them and are invited to join in by keeping God's instruction for their lives. But was, was the covenant dependent on it? And we'll think about that later. The one thing that the resource hopefully, uh, helpfully sorry, highlights for me is that all of these Old Testament covenants build on one another. And they find their ultimate fulfilment in Jesus who came to make right the fractured relationship with God that began in the garden. And so I want us to take just a moment to think about the different covenants that we've been reflecting on, learning about over the last month. The covenants with Noah, Abraham, Moses, David, and of course the new covenant with Jesus that we started this calendar year off by thinking about. I don't know what might have stood out to you, what might have been in there stuck in your head that all these covenants and that reminder that now through Jesus we too are all invited to live in covenant relationship with him. And as we just spent a moment thinking about that, we can turn back to those words that we thought about last week, that we learned, we started to learn at least last week. It looks as though um, uh, Jakey and Ted have gone out of the meeting and the boys with Oella out the back as well, Victoria's avoiding eye contact down there. So, 
I'll do the actions again. You're very good at drawing in if you want to join in the event. But there were some reminders that Noah built the most enormous boat that kept the birds and animals afloat. And if you remember nothing else, maybe you remember this, the Lord was good, the Lord was strong, and Noah lived his life for him. It then talks about Moses. Moses led his people through the sea, taking them away from Calvary, slavery, sorry, not Calvary, anyway, but never mind. Taking them away from slavery, the Lord was good, the Lord was strong. And then of course, thank you, oh thank you, that all through history you were faithful. Thank you, thank you, that you are just the same when it comes to me. It talks about David who brought the life of one, a humble shepherd boy who became a king. It talks about Daniel who was inside the lion's den, but who God brought to safety once again. And then there's that bit about us. Jesus tried to take away our sins so that we could get to know our God again. The Lord is good. The Lord is strong. We live in response to that faithfulness that we see about him. We will live our lives for him. Teddy's obviously in a bit of a mood this morning, so I might be asking him to come down and run to I don't know if Jakey is there. I don't know if he wants to come up the front to help. Do you want to do the actions with me, Jakey? Yeah, and if anyone else wants to join in, but otherwise we'll send it as we sing these words along with the video on the screen. Thank you, John. <coughs>
thank you very much. Well done. Joe, you did well. Ted seems to be in a horrible mood this morning, which is attempting to put me in a horrible mood, which is awful from the platform, isn't it? <laughs> well, it's the hoodie, is it? There we go. Well, there we go. Seeing as they're up the front, I'm going to ask, I'm going to try, with, with, with my and Mummy's help. Oh, dear. Right, Ted, go to Mummy, please. That's it. Right, JP, can you help me? All right. And uh, maybe Matt with, with your mum and then Teddy with his mummy as well. All right, because I don't want anything to do with that today. But anyway, so, um, so, here we go. Right, then. So, what I'm going to ask you to do, we are going to have, we've already done it. We're going to have this morning a bit of a penalty shootout, all right? Yeah? You, you know what a penalty shootout is? When you get the ball and you have to kick it in there, is that okay? That's okay, because I've done some. Do that. And you can do that, that's good. I, but I give it a good whack. A good whack, that's it, that's the idea. So, that, that's it, there's not going to be a goal today, but we're going to, we're going to actually shoot out what happens to the teams, alright? So, you can both, you're both going to be team captains, is that alright? I was going to get the ball. But we've not got any goalies today, alright? So, there we go, I was going to get the basketball hoop out. I'm so sorry for that. I was going to get the basketball hoop out the other room, but then I saw how big it was and how complicated it was to put together. So, we're doing this instead. So, boys, I want you to pick four different people to be on your team. So, do you want to pick someone to be on your team first? Who do you want to be on your team? Nana! Nana! Excellent, it's Jamie Charles. Excellent. <laughs> Teddy, who do you want to be on your team? Oh, we pretend to be shy now. Who, who do you want to be on your team? Or should we ask Mummy to pick someone for us? Yeah, we'll let Mummy be number one pick for you. Jakey, is your Mummy number two pick for you? Yeah, yeah alright, so Matt and Nikki are on Jakey's team. Ted and Victoria, who do you want to be your third pick? Who do you want to pick third, third person? Shall we? Which one? Song There we go. Song has been called up. There we go. Pick number three for you, Jake. Julie. There we go. It's been. This would be interesting in the pits and hills. But there we go. Pick number four, uh, three for you. Here we go. 
actually, no, you're, you've got quite a lot bigger than uh, Ted and Jakey. So, um, let's try and equal it up a bit. So, um, there we go. So, one round. Samuel 
to be king. It was a bit like PE or the school playground. The prophet Samuel had gone to Jesse because God had told him that one of his sons would be king. And the seven older, fitter, stronger, taller, however you like to imagine them and think of them brothers, all traditionally far more suitable choices to be king passed before Samuel only for God to say no. It's none of them. So they brought David in from the field. David, who everyone thought of as being the last choice, the last resort, turned out to be God's first pick. And this morning for us, God has chosen us all to live and be in covenant relationship with him through Jesus. Those things that we might think of that make us not good enough or not suitable, God doesn't look at. But as 1 Samuel 16 said of the us, the Lord looks at the heart. Last week I encouraged us that there were still things that we can all be doing as we continue to faithfully respond to God in our lives. And if God can take someone who was seen to be small and puny like David and do everything that he did in and through and for him, then there's incredible promise in what God can do and what God can still do in and through and for each one of us, for me and for you. As I will think a bit more about David's story and David's response to covenantal living in a moment, but now we're going to hear the message from the band. After the band, we'll move into the offering, and once we've received the offering, the songsters will bring their message to us. Thank you.
day of our lives. And we are very mindful this morning of those people who, those people and situations that need you in a very urgent way. And so we pray that the money that we give will help those who need it. In the name of Jesus Christ, Amen.
God's people have entered Canaan. The new huge family promised to Abraham have finally reached the promised land, but eventually they demand a king. They want to be like the other nations around them and are already losing sight of the covenant at Mount Sinai. But God gives the people what they want and Saul is anointed as Israel's king, although he fails to obey God. So God chooses David to be king over Israel and if you want to fill in some of the blanks between David being chosen as king Remembering that Saul was still on the throne at this point, to David actually becoming king, and Nick King in his little book, The Big Story, just as a page summary of that whole period of different references, there's a copy there, it will give us a bit of an idea. But in the end, David becomes a successful leader, overcoming Israel's enemies and restoring order, and he wants to build a temple for God to dwell with his people again prompting the response that God spoke through the prophet Nathan that we heard earlier in our time together. Rather than anything that David could do, God wanted to live in covenant with him and promises to make his name great and raise up a descendant from his line whose throne and kingdom will last forever. And for David and his descendants, they're to remain faithful to God, following the covenantal laws, but despite their failure to do it, God keeps his promise to provide a faithful descendant. We thought about how the Salvation Army has brought us a couple of days to summarise the covenant of the day. That's how the Bible project summarises the covenant. I've mentioned Nick Page's book, if you want to have a look afterwards, but Nicky Gumbel puts it like this, the victory of Jesus, that promised faithful descendant, was foreshadowed in the life of David. There are over a thousand references to David in the Bible. He was anointed the Messiah King, and we're told in the first three verses of that reading you heard earlier from 2 Samuel 7, that the Lord gave David rest from all his enemies around him, and Nathan the prophet said to him, whatever you have in mind, go ahead and do, for the Lord is with you. Before in chapter 8, we're told the Lord gave David victory wherever he went. And so as we come to think about three particular responses to covenantal living that we find in those verses from 2 Samuel that we heard, let's pray. We could do a whole series thinking about David, just as we could have done a whole series on Noah and on Abraham and on Moses. And I'd encourage you to go home and find some different ways 
of engaging with the bigger story of the different people who we've been thinking about, because I can't do justice to their lives and faith in the time, in this time that we spend together on a Sunday morning. So, for everything that I could say about David, I want to pick up on three particular things that stood out for me when I read our Bible reading earlier in the week. And as I was thinking about how it speaks into my, how it speaks into one faithful and faith-filled response to living in covenant with God today. And so first, in verse 5, God asks David, are you the one? Are you the one to build a house, to build me a house to dwell in? And the short answer, of course, is no, he's not. His son Solomon would build the temple, and in his dedication to the temple, Solomon said, My father David had it in his heart to build a temple for the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. But the Lord said to my father David, You did well to have it in your heart to build a temple for my name. Nevertheless, you are not the one to build the temple, but your son, your own flesh and blood. He is the one who will build the temple for my name. That's 1 Kings chapter 8. And so instead, David's role was to lead God's people in Israel to a place of security and rest in the promised land. Again, in Solomon's words recorded in 1 Kings chapter 5 this time, David's role was to establish the peace that was needed for the temple to be built. And so in our response to living in covenant with God, that got me thinking about our sense of purpose, what we believe God is calling us to do. Those things that it's good to have in our hearts, but maybe our God. So it got me thinking about those things that bubble up inside us as we think about what God is going to do. Maybe, when maybe, our role looks different to what we're imagining. I'm a big picture kind of person. And I can remember a leadership team meeting months and months ago where I shared a lot of ideas of ex that excited me as I thought about everything that God could do in and through and for this place. And someone very calmly and very wisely asked me, okay, and one of those things are your priority or is your priority? All these things on my heart that it'd be good to do, but maybe things that I won't get to see, but things that maybe other people sat in front of me this morning will rise up and do. And as we think about how God chooses all of us to experience his promise and to join in with what he's doing, it's easy to get excited and distracted and carried away. And when actually we're thinking about all these different things that could happen, that we could do, that we could be a part of, it might actually stop us from doing the one thing that we need to be doing. And so I'd encourage you, I'd encourage us to spend time discerning God's purpose for us, for ourselves, in the bigger picture of what God is doing. Secondly, in verse 7, you got a, a glimpse of it earlier, and following on from that thought, God asks David, did I ever say, why have you not built me a house of cedar? <laughs> like I said a moment ago, getting carried away and excited about the wrong things in the, in the sense that they're not for us to worry about, might lead to nothing happening. But first and foremost, it might lead to misunderstanding. And my study Bible describes how David misunderstood the Lord's priorities for him. He reflected the cultural no notion that the gods were interested in human beings only as builders and maintainers of their temples. Instead, as we heard in those words that God gave to Nathan, the Lord had raised up means in Israel to shepherd his suddenly God called David in from the field and looking after the family of God begins to make a bit more sense. And so in our response 
to live in covenant with God. Let's take the time to understand where he's called us from, what he's called us to, and where he's calling us to go. Because we'll notice, we'll notice love, we'll notice the symmetry, we'll notice the combination. And as we try to get our heads around that, understanding the why behind his invitation to do life with him in a covenantal way, it's easy to look around us and to see the good that others are doing, whether that's individually or in other church settings or other charitable groups in our communities and city. And the temptation is to simply try and recreate it within our context. It looks good and is working there, so we want a bit of it here. Although it might be good, God invites us to be a part of his best. And that means taking time to faithfully respond to what he is inviting us, individually and as a body of his people, to be a part of. <laughs> Lastly, verse 11 grounds the point we've just been thinking about. God says through Nathan that the Lord himself will establish a house. Commentators compare that statement to God's question in verse 5. Are you the one to build it? me a home, they parallel the two, and they say in this beautiful play on words, God says that David is not to build him a house, the temple, but instead God will build David a house that will last forever. It places all the emphasis on God. And that's why I like maybe go back and you look at those essential covenant ingredients that the Salvation Army resources identified. Like Noah, this is an unconditional covenant between God and David. It's not reliant on him doing anything. It's not reliant on his faithfulness, although it's asked for. God is going to keep his promise and do his thing anyway, and sometimes in spite of David and his people. And so in our response to living in covenant, the new covenant through Jesus with God. Where do we place the emphasis? Is it on us? And on what we can and can't do? Is it on what we'd like to do and on what we actually end up doing? Or is it that God and everything that he will do? Again, my study Bible describes how this covenant is grounded only in God's firm and gracious purpose. And that's the all I want to leave us with today. How and where do we recognise God's firm and gracious purpose? And how do we, how do you and I, accept his invitation to join in? To join in without muddling his purpose with our priorities, without misunderstanding and being distracted by the world around us and what others are doing around us, without thinking that it boils down to us. We're going to take some time to reflect and to respond for ourselves. And to help us, we're going to turn to Psalm 397 in the song, where we can simply express our desire to honour and worship God in these moments. The words that link us back to Psalm 89, the words that we started our time with the same, in every breath of my body, every beat of my heart, be dedicated to your praise and glory. And in these words from the song, we sing and we ask of God. Lord, every breath that I take, every moment that I will make, have your way in me. And if as we see these words, we want to come to this place of prayer at the front of our hall and pray that we would get out of the way as God does his thing and simply accept his invitation to be there and for you to join me. Then the opportunity is to do it. Is there to do it during this time?
your best where we think that it all boils down to us.
of God's grace shall we share the grace together this morning. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us.